السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We always commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household, all his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of them, to bless every single one of us and to grant ease to those who are struggling and suffering on the globe at large at this particular moment. There are countless people who are struggling and suffering. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them ease and open their doors too. My beloved brothers and sisters, in a football match, the whistle is blown. What do you have? You have approximately 90 minutes to do what? Score as many goals as you can. Is that correct? In 90 minutes, if you score 20, 30 goals, you have a world record. And in 90 minutes, your job is only to run from one side to the other. And if you don't, if you come the other way, you score what is known as an own goal, where you are in trouble. And if the team wins, the other team wins because of your own goal, perhaps your career is at stake and your value drops. And people know the rules. The whistle is blown. Up to the time the whistle is blown right at the end, you're only trying to do one thing. You're running from one end to the other to score. So between the posts, you're trying to get this ball kicked from one side and you're dribbling everyone, you, you, you're tackling the people, those who are trying to divert you and distract you and take the ball away from you, you are making sure that you maneuver your way through them in a very tactful way. And the person who knows how to dribble the best is literally the hottest in football. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. Similarly, in my life and in your lives, the whistle is blown and the whistle of the end shall be blown 70 years later or it shall be blown sometimes 90 years later. The only thing you have to do from the beginning to the end is good deeds. Every time you need to score that goal of a deed, you don't waste your time. Shaitan will come and dribble you this way, that way. The one who's the hottest at it is he who can out dribble the devil. And make sure that he doesn't lose focus. Never allow an own goal to be scored. So this is the gist. Today, if you take a look at what is going on, there are 60,000 people, 120,000 people at the stadium watching those dribbling the ball. Most of them don't even know how to play football, but they are so excited. From amongst us, the bulk of us are busy sitting and watching the World Cup, subhanallah, and we don't even know how to play football. We couldn't even run from here to the car park, to be honest. And we are the biggest fundies and the biggest professors of who should have done what and why they shouldn't have done this and that, yet we cannot kick a ball to save our lives. And this is what happens to us in our lives. We sit and we watch other people doing ibadat and winning and they are earning the pleasure of Allah in a beautiful way. We are doing absolutely nothing, pointing fingers at them, why they are wrong, backbiting about them, slandering about them when we ourselves have done no good deeds whatsoever. We sit and relax, just like football. We sit and relax, we get joy and enjoyment by bickering about others, talking about them, and literally trying to pretend like we know better than them, yet our own lives are at a loss. So something we should learn from the World Cup that is going on right now. And I want to start off by telling you that our whistle is actually blown at puberty. So if you look at a football player, he doesn't just become a World Cup star, just like that. There is a lot of training that goes on. Some people are born, their parents are so concerned about them that they make sure that they get football training from birth, from a young age. They have the ball, they are watching games, they are made sure, they have coaches, they pay money, they get from the age of two and three, they are learning how to kick balls and so on, such that they become those who are champions in the world at one stage. With us, up to the age of puberty, and that is the maturity, when your books are opened and the records are starting, when your salah becomes farad, your prayer becomes compulsory because now you are mature. Before that, it wasn't. You have a little child, we should train them before they get onto the football pitch. I'm calling it a football pitch because we're talking about the World Cup. But in reality, that is the pitch of life. It's the reality when you as a parent need to bring up your child. From minute one, Allah says, call out the adhan in the ear of this child. He didn't say bring a football and put it there. 
He didn't say bring tennis rackets and put them there. Call out the adhan. Why? Because the, primarily the goals will be scored through salah. My brothers and sisters, let's wake up to this reality. What do we learn? The goal is scored when you got up for fajr. You've really scored such a big goal that the devil is shamed. You are one zero above. And by the time the day is over, you must be five bar. That's what they call it, don't they? But sometimes we see two, three, three, two. Sometimes the devil wins, we lose. A'udhu billah. Sometimes we're lucky if we scored one. It's five zero the other way around. Five nil, they call it. What a humiliation. May Allah protect us. You know, when your favorite team is losing 3-0, 4-0, people start crying. Some people become depressed. They got to have tablets to soothe themselves. And yet we've lost 5-0 against the devil with salah and prayer. And we don't even mind. So what did you learn from football? Is it just to sit and watch like the rest of the world is watching? Or do you realize there is a reality behind it? There is a reality that a Muslim should understand. We should not be wasting our time such that we even allow the devil to overtake us. We can kick the ball. We know how to do it. We can dribble we just need a little bit of control and self-control and we know that there is a temptation this side we dodge it and go the other side there is a temptation on the other side we've dodged it and we move the other side but to be honest with you it starts off with parents you have a child did you understand what was the reasoning behind the adhan being called out in the ear of the child what was the reasoning it was because the importance of the salah is such that come to true success. Today, if you were picked to be in one of the top teams of the globe, you'd be excited. The golfers would be excited. The tennis players would be even more thrilled to be playing with big, big names in the, you know, in the world of tennis and so on. But for us, that is not the real success. That is a temporary pastime of the dunya. The proper match and the real world cup is actually the Jannah cup. That which you will get and inshallah I will get by the help and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the youngsters come and tell us, do you know what? Well, whether you do good deeds or not, it is the mercy of Allah that will get you into Jannah. That statement is technically correct, but it has a lot of deviation in it if worded that way. Because it is the mercy of Allah that will get you into Jannah. But how do I earn the mercy of Allah? I will earn it by trying my best to obey His commands. That's what it is. So if I purposely do bad deeds thinking as it is, it's the mercy of Allah that's going to get me to Jannah. You need to knock on the door of the mercy of Allah. By doing what? You need to knock on the door of the mercy of Allah by trying to do good. So that is knocking the door. He is the one who will open the door of the mercy. But if we're walking in the other direction, where is the door going to open? So my brothers and sisters, here is the whistle. It is blown at the age of puberty. Before that, learn how to play the ball. Allahu Akbar. What ball am I talking about here? You need to learn your Quran prior to that. So this is why you have children of the young age, mashallah. We are in, instructed as Muslimin to take such a keen interest that you teach them alif and ba. You teach them the meaning of the Quran. You teach them what salah is all about. They are supposed to be watching you dribble the ball and they see you and they learn from you. Imagine if you're a top football player, your children will know how to play completely because they watch you and they can kick the ball properly. Those of us who play cricket perhaps, you are interested every day in cricket. When your son is born, you say, hey let's go Saturday I take you cricket I show you the lines because tomorrow when I'm not there you can really score the sixes so much so that now the youngsters are talking about a new type of a scoring in cricket where if the ball goes right outside the whole pitch and everywhere else it won't be a six anymore it will be an eight <coughs> may Allah grant us ease look how excited the guys get score an eight did you ever hear of two fours in a cricket no you haven't one day you will may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness but we want to score the eight when it comes to something else and that is the goodness so as keen as we are if we were footballers to teach our children what football is all about because we are the champions don't you and I want to be the champions of Jannah teach your children salah if your child watches you swearing you have taught him how to score an own goal that's all you did you told him son those goals that you are seeing on the other side are actually the ones we are supposed to be scoring in. But you know what? We can't really go there. It's too far. So just score it on this side. That's what we're doing. He watches you swearing. The kids will tell you, hey, you're a fool. Dad, what are you talking about? You score that side. This is an own goal. Come on, we're playing for England. May Allah grant us ease. As it is, England is out. My brothers and sisters, to be honest with you, the reality is we have to have a wake-up call. If you look at life itself, wallahi, you can learn so much from a match. Because 
The same way that the minute starts ticking and the stopwatch starts as soon as the whistle blows, my stopwatch and yours has already started, believe me, and it's coming to an end. The final whistle shall be blown when it will be too late. In the meantime, we know what the score is. Let's be honest. You know what your score is roughly. You know how bad or good you are. You know how hard you try for salah or not. And it's easier to dribble the devil than it is to dribble a ball. Because to dribble a ball, sometimes what would happen is it sometimes the tact and maybe the, how quick the person is and how experienced they are. So they tell you this one is a top dribbler. If he's there, the whole stadium is screaming and shouting because he's got the ball. And they know he's going to get far. But when it comes to the devil, you just need to get up. You just need to fight yourself. There's no actual dribbling of that nature that there is of a ball. The chances of him winning over you, they can be minimized if you strengthen your iman. That's all it is. So you don't have to flex your muscles and you don't have to start warming up before the match in a muscular way. No, you just need to strengthen your iman. You need to remember Allah. <laughs> the hearts achieve the calmness through the remembrance of Allah. So that calmness, what does it do to you? It makes you get up for Salatul Fajr. It makes you be honest. When your child sees that you're getting up every day in the morning at 5 o'clock, for example, half past 4, for example, the child will grow up looking at you, watching that everyone's awake, they're all having tea at 6 o'clock in the morning, I better be a part of it. And it becomes something that is a family affair, something good because you got up early, not for the tea, but for that which was before the tea. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Thinking of the tea, the golfers get excited because they know their tea of times are also quite early. So we get up for golf because the tea off is 6 o'clock. We're out there at the golf course at 5 past 5. We were driving towards it because we know, hey, my tea off is 6 o'clock. What happened to your fajr, my brother? Hey, I would get late for my tea off, so I missed out my fajr. If that's the case, you lost everything. You can have a hole in one. Here, you actually have a hole in zero. I don't even know how to call that, but that's what it is. Because you've missed out completely. Even if you lost that hole, whatever it was, and they even, you know, had to reschedule your entire tea off because you were late. You know what happens? You, got to, you then got to wait for a little slot and every, all the inconvenience as a result. But when it comes to Salatul Fajr, that whole day is inconvenienced. And you know what? Your Jannah is at stake. So remember this. My beloved brothers and sisters, let me tell you, a footballer, it takes so much of training and then they go from one stage to another. When they notice at school level, this guy is a good footballer, what will they do? They then pick him up, say, hey son, you know how to kick the ball. Come, let's go. There is now these coaching classes and clinics. They call them clinics. So you enter a football clinic and a big guy comes to train and a big guy comes to coach. And if one of the big names come in, you're excited and we're running. What do we do? We eat. We make sure we have protein, we make sure we pump weights, we make sure we have a lot of uh, liquid, and we make sure we are fit, we run out every morning, the energy is going, we dribble through little cones and conicals that are put in the pitch, and we try scoring these goals, and we sit either as goalkeepers or as those who are shooting, and so on, and we keep on training. How often? Every single day. Every day. Because of what? I want to make it to the national team. That's all. So what do I do? Energy, effort, food, dedication. Such dedication that we've never applied it to religion. We've never applied it to Allah. When, you, when we die, we cannot tell the angel of death, hey, hang on, take my soul nicely because I could kick a ball. Take my soul nicely because you know what? I used to play off three under par. How's that? Three under par. Allahu Akbar. May Allah protect us. That will not help you. It might be part of your passing of the time in the dunya. We are not saying don't enjoy your life in the dunya. But within limits, do not give it preference over your akhirah. That's all that is being said. So some people say these ulama stand up and tell us not to do this, not to do that. So what should we do? The reality is you can do whatever is within the limits. But you're not allowed to give it preference over the akhirah. And let me tell you, you might not make it through the end right to the end of the match. Do you know why? You might have a red card 40 minutes later. So you might have a red card 20 years down the line, which means you're out, you're death, it's over, you're dead. What did you score? Well, you know what, I'm off the pitch anyway. Everyone else is carrying on. The match carries on without you. You had a red card. Some have a yellow card. You know what's the yellow card? A warning in your life to say, hang on, you're about to go. Or you suffer a big struggling loss in terms of health or in terms of business or divorce or anything else. That's your yellow card to warn you, hey, you're going to be banned from the next match now. That's how it works sometimes.
Or you get a double yellow card, you've got a problem, a very big problem, because you know it's going to be affecting the future matches and so on. Next thing, the man picks out a red card. You can debate with him, argue with him. He'll kick you out straight. You walk. You have no option. What happens to us in life, we think we're going to be on the pitch for 90 years. And Allah knows you, your life is only going to be 40 years, 20 years, 35 years, 50 years, 55 years, 60 years. And you're going to be out. Your red card is coming. So for you, the final whistle won't even be blown in terms of the whole match. But you're going to be out. What did you do if you scored at least? You're going to be a champion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to score spiritual goals. May He make us from those who can score goals against the devil. Because we have a battle. And you know what? You don't need to run every day. You don't need to pant and sweat every day. You don't need to pump weights every day. You don't need to have the diet of protein and so on in order to build yourself a little bit so that they cannot knock you down. You don't need all that. You actually need much less than that. The taraweeh that we are about to engage in in salah in Ramadan is much more beautiful. It requires much less energy than a 90 minute match that you will be playing. For example, for a football match. But the reality is we will sit and watch the football, but we'll be complaining about 90 minutes of salah, whereas taraweeh, the whole of the taraweeh, will not take more than one hour, 10 minutes, one hour, 15 minutes. We're complaining. But there, one and a half hours we can sit, and we are happy and we are yelling and screaming. The imam is reading. He is probably better than all those footballers put together, and we're busy complaining. Hey, you know what? It's too hot here. But go to Brazil right now. It is sweltering. And at the same time, it is humid, but everyone is excited. If I were to give out tickets tonight to go to the World Cup, I'm sure, well, you know what, I might join you. But anyway, Allah, make it easy for us. I probably wouldn't. I only said it on a lighter note. But the reality is, Allah, make it easy for us. We have it. We would probably go. You know what? The reality is, let's not look at what's right and wrong for that for now. But let's try and see when you are given a ticket to come to the masjid for Allah, not for 90 minutes, but less. And we feel so lazy and we complain on top of that. And we cannot sit for 10, 15 minutes after that. What did we achieve? We want to watch people kick a ball, but we cannot even kick the devil out of our own lives. Subhanallah. Look at this. So what do we learn from this World Cup? We learn that whilst it is going on, the the distraction that we have in terms of our deen and religion is such that if you don't draw a lesson from it, you've lost. Lost completely. If I ask you today, all of us, myself included, what's your favorite team? You might have an answer. Some of you might not, like myself. I, I always say my team wins. And they say, why? Because I support the winning team. It's over. So whoever's winning, we support them. And halfway through the match also, if someone else is winning, we support those. And near the end, if someone else is winning, we support them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us because we're not into football. But at the same time, the lesson being derived is so important because, you know, our life is like an hourglass. An hourglass that is turned the other way around. You're born and perhaps, like I said, the counting starts at, the, at puberty, right? So when you attain puberty, you mature now, perhaps the age of 10, 12, 15 and so on, uh, depending, that would be the maximum reaching 15. At that age of puberty, your salah becomes farad. Your match has started, whether you like it or not. You cannot just sit back and say, right, wait. They're playing, the ball is moving, you better start going. Because if you don't go to the masjid and read your salah, it's written against you, it's a goal already. You just watch it. You know, the youngsters who play games, when you've got to put in big money to play those games, you know some of these malls that have like a little game area, you put in some money and you can ride the car or drive the, the, the motor vehicle or perhaps uh, have a go at the motorbike and sometimes they like simulators and so on. If you put in a lot of money, you have to make sure you know how to play the game because sometimes before you've even started touching the buttons, it says game over and you look at it and you say, this thing is a cheat. You start wanting to hit the screen there, but it's your fault. You didn't learn how to play the game before your father or anyone or yourself put in the money. You put in so much money, watch other people play the game and see what's going on because before you know it, your money's gone, you didn't enjoy the game and the guy before you was really enjoying it, the simulating so much and you were saying hey I want to do this next and your father says okay son no problem but when you went on it you wasted your time may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us through reality that's just a game reality we do this our game is over our child doesn't know how to read salah and he passed away our, the, his game was over and we didn't even show him what the Quran was all about. We never told him what truthfulness is all about. The importance of Ramadan, the night of Laylatul Qadr, everything else. How to respect the ulama who are going to teach you how to dribble the devil. 
We don't have respect for them. They know how to dribble the devil. Sometimes the devil might out dribble them also in one or two things. But bottom line is they know very well. The coaches of today were probably champions of yesterday. But today they're no longer on the pitch. But they're sitting and telling the guys, this is how you kick the ball. When I saw you running, you were doing this. You must run that way there. You guys must learn to pass the ball. Because without passing the ball, it's not a one-man show. It's a team effort. That brings us to another lesson we learned from football. In football, you have to pass the ball. If you don't pass the ball, what will happen? You lose because you'll be out dribbled. But if you know how to pass it, you must gauge where your colleagues are. You need to cooperate with one another. This ummah is such that if we do not cooperate with one another and we think I'm the only one, the ummah is going to suffer. This is why I say, some people say, you know what? The work I do is the only work of Islam. Whatever anyone else is doing, it's not the work of Islam. That's a mistake. That means they are one man show. They want to dribble the ball on their own. I tell people, you know what? Allah has made us differently. Some people, they don't want to become doctors. They want to become perhaps architects. Some people don't want to be architects. They want to be plumbers. Some people don't want to become plumbers. They want to be something else. Whatever the child likes, alhamdulillah, and Allah has blessed them with, let them be that. And each one together will make up a whole community and society. The same with us. Some of us can serve Islam through our money because we're not good at much more. But we'll do our own farad and our own duties. But over and above that, we can serve through our money. Some people serve through building a masjid. Some people serve through building madrasas. Some people are very good at teaching. Other people might have a lot of knowledge but they don't have any know-how of teaching. So whatever Allah has blessed you with, use it, that's a field. But we will keep on passing the ball. I respect you because you teach my children. You respect me because I would like to lecture. And I have another gift which Allah has blessed me with. Someone can re recite Quran so well, so he's our imam. We respect him, but he's a different field altogether. Some people are blessed at going out and speaking to other Muslims, encouraging them and reforming themselves. That is brilliant. But to be honest with you, there are others who are gifted at talking to non-Muslims. And there are others who perhaps are gifted at teaching the Quran. There are some who are gifted at perhaps motivating people. All this is part and parcel of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some people are gifted at sitting behind a monitor and, and talking to people online, inviting them to goodness. So that is what they are gifted with. Some of the women are doing this, subhanallah. If that is the case, alhamdulillah, we should be respecting them and we should be reaching out to them, at least make dua for them. They are part and parcel of our team. Whilst we are here dribbling, they are also dribbling, subhanallah. When I say dribbling, I'm talking of the ball. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. So my brothers and sisters, as I said, we as a child is young should grow the child up such that they have a keen interest and they know exactly what is required of them. Because to be honest, we came in this world for one purpose, just like the footballer knows for 90 minutes, the only thing I have to do is to score goals. We are also in this world in order to score goals, as many as you can. You can read voluntary salah, read your voluntary prayers as well. Your farad, how many Qur'ans you can complete, how much you can learn, how much you can teach others. Do not waste a single droplet of time. The hadith of Muhammad wasallam says, a wasted moment moment is really something you've lost forever. It's something that's not going to come back. So you have it now, use it. You have your wealth now, use it. You have your young age now, use it. You can read Salah standing now, read as much as you can. Pack away as many goals as you can. Wallahi, you will win the match by the mercy of Allah. By the mercy of Allah. But to expect the mercy of Allah, and whilst expecting the mercy of Allah, we keep on sinning, thinking that it's only the mercy of Allah that will take me to paradise anyway, then we are walking away from the mercy of Allah. That's what we are doing. So may Allah not do that to us. My brothers and sisters, it's a very, very important lesson we have here. So I score goals, but I need to remember, just like a footballer would score a goal, and if he is the one who's right at the front and the ball hasn't yet come to where he is, he is called offside. Do you agree? Offside meaning after that, even if you scored, they're not going to allow that goal. Why? Because you were offside. The same applies to us. We have read our salah sometimes. We have read Quran sometimes, but we backbite about this one. We slander that one. So the salah is gone because we were offside. It was given to someone else. You know, we cheated that man and we kept fast throughout the month. It's gone. Where did it go? It went to the other guy because we stole his wealth. It went to that man because we spread a rumor about him. So we sit here thinking, hey, I scored a goal. But you don't realize the referee has declared it a no goal because you were offside. What else did we learn? For football, we know it very well. But for our lives, we don't realize. This is the World Cup for you. We want the Jannah Cup. 
We want the cup of paradise, really. And that is something we need to achieve. Brothers and sisters, there comes a time in football where they give you a break, 45 minutes down the line. They tell you, and you sit. You sit for how long? A little while. You might have a bit of a drink. You might go this way, that way. It's called half time, where the people quickly move off their TVs. You know what I'm talking about? And they come back quickly. Hey, once it starts, you better call me back again. And we get back. Let me tell you something. The difference is with us, there is no rest. The match continues throughout. It goes on. Yes, Allah gives us happy days every year. The day of Eid al-Adha and the day of Eid al-Fitr. But then Allah tells us that on those days of happiness, we will add one extra prayer, one extra salah. So for us to, to be at ease and to rest, it's actually proven by doing something extra for Allah. Every happy occasion in Islam, there's something extra to do. Say for example, in nikah, when people are getting married, what a happy occasion. There is a little khutbah of nikah that is sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa It's an extra khutbah. Take a look at Friday, a blessed day. There is an extra khutbah that is there, something more. So for us as Muslims, don't be mistaken that you need to sit back and relax. You know, now I've read salah for 10 years. Now for one year, I'm going to give it a break. It doesn't work that way. That is one thing that is totally different. What we need to do, you read salah for 10 years, it will become easier for you. Can I guarantee you something? When you do not miss a single salah for 40 days in a row and your intention is to carry on for your life, after you knocked out 40 days completely, it becomes so easy that I promise you, and I know a lot of you here will agree with me, come time for fajr, your eye is open automatically. You don't even need a clock. Your eye is open. Why? Because you're now used to it. 40 days of a little bit of discipline and the rest of it, Allah says, I do it for you. Don't worry. I've realized that you, you are trying to come close. You, your eye opens. You cannot sleep. So I cannot sleep. I'm awake. Allah's made me awake at this time. But I'm just watching the curtain and saying it's still not light. What am I doing? I'm busy letting the devil score a goal. He's coming so close to the goalpost. All I have to do is just get up and he's blocked. As soon as I get up, the goalpost is covered because now the devil cannot score the goal. That's why we say salah, don't wait for the devil to score the goal on you. The trick or the secret regarding prayer is as soon as the time comes in, get up and pray. Read your salah. As soon as the time comes in, no matter what salah it is. For example, in the masjid, if the salah is half past seven, you need to be here early on time. If you think, ah, it's still 29, there's still a minute. Ah, that imam, I know him to the guy who's going to read tonight. As it is, he reads long. We'll go, don't worry, relax, take it easy. You know, drink your tea quickly. If that's the case, before you know it, the rakat is gone, the salah is gone. The, the devil has scored a big goal. And if, you, if you're not careful, he's going to score another one because one is you missed the jama'ah and another one is you're going to miss the whole salah because you're going to come to the masjid, everyone's walking out, you're too shy. Because sometimes you come late for, for Isha and some of the youngsters who are mischievous, they say, Uncle, you're quite early for Fajr, you know that? Allahu Akbar, may Allah grant us ease. Allahu Akbar. You know the mischievous youngsters, they have a lot to say sometimes. So... Instead of that, we just say, let's sit in the car, let's just go back home. It's embarrassing to walk into the masjid now. And then we go home, we forget about the salah. Before you know it, you're snoring. And next thing, the time is over and it's already fajr. What happened? The devil scored two goals. All you had to do was get up. So you don't even have to dive from one corner to another. You just have to get up, fulfill your salah. That's it. May Allah strengthen us. My brothers and sisters, remember what we're saying tonight. It might sound on a lighter note. It might sound like we're drawing a parallel with the football that's going on. But I did it intentionally because the football is going on. And let's be honest, the fever has gripped even the Muslim communities. Sometimes even more. So let's take a lesson from it. We don't want to talk about how halal or haram anything is. We want to talk about a lesson that we can learn from it. That look in life, my life is coming to an end and so is yours. When a match starts and the score is 1-0 against you, you still have hope because there's still 89 minutes to carry on, isn't it? So you still have hope. You say, I ah, don't worry, there's time. These guys, they know what they're doing. You know, mashallah, there's Muslim brothers there. They, they know what they're doing, subhanallah. And then we get so excited. Hey, did you see that, that guy there? As soon as he scored a goal, he went to sijda. Hey, mashallah. But you don't even make the real sijdas you're supposed to make. And you're busy becoming proud. Hey, I'm proud of this Muslim champion. Look at him. He made a goal and he went to sijda. Allahu Akbar, what a good Muslim brother. And you didn't read even one salah that day. What was it? Did you learn anything from it? That man probably reads Quran better than you. Recently, I was watching a clip of one of the top champions. He's called Abu Diyabi. You guys might know him. Wallahi, the man reads Quran better than 90% of us here. You can go on YouTube and search it. Quranic recitation. 
He might kick a ball better than all of us who are seated here, but he even reads Quran better than most of us who are here, if not all. May Allah grant us ease. And I'm honest with you. There are others who've spent their wealth building masjids and so on, and they are top footballers in the world. They won't miss a salah, not even one. They, I have had footballers who've said that we are not even going to miss the fast, even though there's a match. Big deal. We'll, we'll fast and go. Allahu Akbar. I'm not saying what's right or wrong in terms of the football, but I'm drawing a lesson. We want to get excited about their expertise in kicking a ball, but we haven't looked at the same people's expertise in earning the pleasure of Allah. If you really want to follow something, follow that which they have already achieved. What they got in terms of a ball is just a bonus, perhaps from a dunya term, from a sportsman's term. But in terms of the deen and in terms of spirituality and the akhirah, the real crux is actually to become regular with what you have. This is it. Look at those people. Like I said moments ago, a lot of us would be able to name 10 or 20 of the Muslim players. I promise you. A lot of us, whether it's cricket or football that we're into, whatever game, we'll tell you this guy's a Muslim, that guy's a Muslim, this guy became a Muslim, that guy's this. And we're so excited about it. Hey, mashallah. But are you real Muslim? Let's be honest. You're talking about them. They're probably more practicing than we are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the lesson. It's a reality. So here we are. The time is ticking. Who knows? We're almost at the end. Our whistle is about to be blown. And you know when the match gets exciting? After the 85th minute. Do you realize that? 85 minutes gone and people are holding their seat. If your team is winning, you say, I hope nobody scores a goal here. And if your team is losing, they're going to score. They're going to score. We look at the screen as though it's because we were looking at the screen. That's why they scored. Ya Allah! Ya Allah! Let the guy score. And we're busy thinking, subhanAllah, but you haven't even read your salah yet. And you're making dua to Allah. And wallahi, the passion with which we make dua for a goal to be scored, we haven't even made dua for our children with that passion. Sometimes. I know of people who have sent me emails. May Allah forgive us all and grant us good hidayah. But the lesson that is learned, people who've sent me emails to say, wallahi, please make a special dua for my team that we win. <laughs> wallahi, without a joke. I'm not lying. Some of you who are on Twitter might want to check it on Twitter as well. People who send a message, please make dua that our team wins. Special dua. I once went, for, went on Umrah and I met a few youngsters. And I was busy talking to them and I was giving them a few examples. The same day, the one of the examples I gave them was this. And there was someone who tweeted saying there were two teams playing in the European finals. And he says, please, I heard you in Umrah. Please make a special dua at the Kaaba for my team to win. And I'm busy thinking, Ya Akhi, have you read your salah? Do you even know what it's all about? Even if your team wins or loses, how did it help you achieve Jannah? You haven't realized your match is about to come to an end. How did you score? The devil is scoring goals against you every single day. What did you do? Subhanallah. We are busy playing a match. It's 20-0 already. All you need to do to score 30 goals and to win is to stand up and fight off your laziness. Become a better person. Watch your mouth and your tongue. See how you treat everyone else. Be an upright person who tries to help everyone else. Worship Allah alone. Try and learn the deen. Learn the Quran. And believe me, you are sailing all the way. Nobody will score a goal against you by the help of Allah. And your whistle will be blown one day. And then what will happen? You've won. You've won. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَيَقُولُ هَاءُمُ قُرَأُ I'm sure by now we know the meaning of this verse. Those who will be given their trophy, basically the book. The book. It's like a trophy. Those who are given their book in their right hands, they will say, hey, here's my book. See my score. This is what happened. So we have this big book and we are sitting here. Hey, this is my score. Everyone's excited. But you know what? The others will get it on the left because they didn't learn a thing. Whilst the people in the dunya were carrying a world cup and dancing about it and getting excited, we got excited with them and we forgot our salah as a result. We forgot our dress code as a result. The dress code is so simple for our brothers and for our sisters. It doesn't require running. I don't need energy. I don't need to pump weights like I say. I don't need to gym every single day. I just need to dress properly. That's all I need to do. I just need to make sure I lower my gaze. What energy has it required of you? And Allah says, you lower your gaze, you dress properly. We will give you contentment in return. We will give you a massive amount of contentment in return. But if you want to wonder your eyes, and if you want to undress or dress in a wrong fashion, you will have to pay for it somehow because someone is scoring, you're losing. Someone is scoring goals against you. You're losing. Subhanallah. May Allah grant us the ability to be strong and steadfast. Brothers and sisters, what a beautiful topic. I'm sure we've learned some lessons. 
And inshallah, I hope and I pray that now when we're sitting and watching that World Cup, if we are, then we need to realize, did I read my salah? If not, I must be strong enough to say, this thing can wait. Because in real life, there are some goals being scored against me right now. I need to go and protect my goalpost. It's empty. You know, when, there's, when we're down to 10 men and we're down to 9 men, how people get so upset because, hey, two guys are out. Hey, these guys are going to score now. And you get so upset and people start crying real tears. People get so excited. They say in, in one of those countries, I think it's Brazil or Argentina or somewhere, they say the robbers know that when we want to rob, we make sure that there's a big game going on. The people are so glued to the TVs that you can come in and greet them. They'll greet you back and you're busy stealing everything behind them and it's gone. And it's gone because they're so glued to the thing because people are just kicking a ball. They've managed to distract us from everything, including our property. Everything distracted. But for me and you, what is important is they must not distract you from Allah because that's reality. That's your real match. That is the Jannah. You know what? Like I said, whistle blown. How many goals are you going to score? Believe me, seize your time. Come to the masjid, learn something, spread something, you know, do good. Develop yourself in every single way and you find one after the other you are a happy content person Even if you don't know the scores of football You are a much happier person than a lot of those who are kicking the ball themselves We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us We ask Allah to grant us ease and goodness I want to give you another example When it comes to football a lot of our youngsters have one or two of their favorite players So if that favorite player cuts his hair in a certain way we cut our hair in that way if he wears a certain emblem, we wear that emblem. If he's got a certain number at the back of his t-shirt, we wear that number. If he's got a name at the back, we wear that name. If he does this, we do that. If whatever he does, we do. So what are we doing? We are basically following his sunnah because we love him. Astaghfirullah. But when we love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that much and more, we've already won the game. So how did he dress? I dressed like that. How did he cut his hair? I cut it like that. What did he do? What emblem did he have? I have that. You know, when I say emblem, he didn't have any emblem. But you could see that this is a proper dress. And this is the dress of the Muslimin and so on. What did he do? I do. How did he do it? I do it. And I don't be shy because when people cut their hair like a little uh, monkey because somebody else cut it like the monkey. So what happens? Everybody looks at you and says, hey, that's the latest style, man. You know, in the UK at the moment, a beard is the in thing. You've got a big beard and hey, that's the style, man. In certain areas, everybody's got it and it's cool, man. It's cool. So because it's cool, we're going to have it? Or because we know that we want to protect ourselves and, and we want to follow the sunnah of Muhammad that we're going to have it. May Allah strengthen us. I always tell the brothers, even if you have a little strand, start with a little strand. You know, when you see the crescent, it starts off with a small little crescent. Fifteen days later, it becomes big. Alhamdulillah. So you might start with a moon, you know. They call it a goatee, but let's call it a moony, inshallah. So you have a little one, and inshallah, it can develop by the help of Allah. At least it's a start by the help of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes we all need to start on different aspects of our life. Some people not, might not be strong enough to start with one aspect. They might have already started with 10 other aspects, and we need to start with them yet. And just because we think, hey, me, I've already got my dress code done. All these guys are losers. Already we're scoring own goals. You know what that means? Why are you thinking bad of the man? If he's got a weakness, you've got another 10 weaknesses. Help each other. Learn to pass. Learn to have the teamwork like we said. Learn to be together. I love you and you are supposed to be loving me. But for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want paradise for you just like you would want it for me. And it's a fact. It's a reality. That's what brings us together. And that's the only thing we are calling towards. Today, the whole discussion is about paradise because we're talking of how to get the Jannah cup. And this is how you would get it. By learning the reality of the world. Do not let the fake life distract you from the real life. This is what we're saying. And this is why Ramadan is around the corner. Right around the corner. Believe me, let's let this month be a month with a difference. Let it be a month with a difference. No matter what the weather is like. No matter what is happening. No matter how long it takes, how short it takes. Believe me, take your time. You know, when a football match goes into overtime... There are two main reasons. One is because nobody has scored or it's, it's at par, right? I don't know if they're still following the same rule, but that's what it used to be some time back. And two is because of injury that happened during the match. So the time lapsed or the time difference is going to be taken and it's going to be put at the end of that match. So it goes to 92 minutes, 92 and a half, and suddenly you find the final whistle. They know what they're doing. 
So to be honest, we get so excited because yes, my team is going to score. Yes, and so on. And we're so excited. The heat of the moment, the most exciting part of a match, a football match, is towards the end. And even more exciting is when it goes into overtime. Very exciting. And people are glued. They'll tell everyone, hey, hang on, we got into overtime. Yes. And you message this guy and tell that guy, unless you're all together and you want to sit together and laugh and joke, we make a plan to be together, to have drinks together, cokes and whatever. And we make sure that everyone's enjoying and we're busy watching and there's the excitement because it's prolonged. But when Salah is prolonged, when Taraweeh is prolonged by an extra five minutes, brother, that Imam, he will have to wear a bulletproof jacket. Because why? He went into overtime. Astaghfirullah. Imam Sahib, what happened to you here, man? How dare? We actually missed the first five minutes of the match. They go to the chairman of the committee, please fire this man. Or they tell him, Imam, tomorrow you better eat some beans. May Allah forgive us. Allah. May Allah forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us. So take your time. Wallahi. And learn that as much as we have to live in the dunya, and as much as we do enjoy, mashallah, our own exercises and some sports and so on, don't give it preference over the akhirah. Don't give it preference over your deen and your, 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 your religion and your aim for heaven. Because the day we die, we're not going to take with us all these things. But what we will take with us is the following. Your deeds. How you converted how you converted whatever Allah gave you during your match into deeds is what will help. You know, you can run on that pitch your whole 90 minutes. If you did not score, you wasted your time. So some people in their lives, they run and they spend time, effort, energy, but they never ever did something to please Allah. So if that's the case, they wasted their 90 minutes. So what we are taught is don't waste your energies for nothing. You might want to run up and down, but score every time so that your effort is not gone wasted. And this is what we're saying. So subhanallah, we need to make sure that that effort is fruitful and bears fruit. We sow a tree. The tree will then grow and it will provide fruit such that even when we die, we will have something known as a sadaqa jariya. People are learning, people continue, our children make dua for us, we've left a brilliant example for them and we've continued in life. So the deeds is what you take. Just like in a football match, it's the goal that you score that matters at the end of the day. It's the goal that you score that matters ultimately. For us, it's the deed that you've done that matters. So I was very healthy. No big deal. What did you do with the health? Did you convert it into deeds when you were healthy? I had lots of spare time. I could go around and chat with my friends. Is that what you used your spare time for? You must convert your spare time into a deed so that when you get to the other side, you've actually scored more than the devil. I, had, I, I was a very good looking guy in my days, you know. So, okay, if you were a good looking guy, what did you do? Did you fall into the trap of the devil or did you score deeds by protecting yourself from the devil? That's something you need to think about because one day your looks are going to go. You're going to become old and wrinkled and you're going to be walking perhaps with a hunchback because that's the sunnah of Allah. It's the plan of Allah. You have to. When you grow older, you have to have certain health matters because Allah is trying to tell you, hang on, you know what? Your game is coming to an end. They start substituting people. Have you seen that? A few minutes, they say, right, substitute. Come on, we're bringing a new guy in with fresh energies. May Allah protect us all. So we need to convert whatever energies we have, whatever resources we have, the wealth we have. The richest man on earth, big deal. What did he do with the money? When he dies, he's not going to take it with him. But if he spent it in a good cause and he used it for something which was correct, what he's done is he's converted it into a currency that is going to be valid in the akhirah. And that is known as D-double-E-D, -E a deed. He converted it into a deed. So now, how wealthy were you? You can't say, I was a multi-billionaire. What did you do with the wealth? Allah is going to ask you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us and grant us a lesson. And I'd like to end now. My 45 minutes are almost up. And I was the one who imposed that limit on myself. Because I believe if we speak much longer than that, you might miss the beginning of the next match. May Allah grant us lesson. So, <laughs> the truth is, what we've learned tonight. I hope we can take it in a way that I had meant it. Don't take it wrong. What we meant is to draw a parallel between these two things. To say one is just a football game. 
It's the World Cup. The fever has gripped the world. And everyone is excited. And everyone wants to check. And everyone wants to watch. And the players are excited. And the people are more excited than the players. And the bookies are trying to make money. I bet you this, I bet you that. You know, if people had to bet that we didn't read Fajr, would they make money? Question. Allahu Akbar. You better make sure it goes the other way around. As it is, betting is not allowed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. We are trying to say that, you know what? Your life is real. It's not just a game. It's real. It's reality. So you need to do as best as you can. Work as hard as you can. Learn the game. Learn it. And in fact, it's not a game, but it's a reality. Let's be calling it a game just for purposes of understanding or relating, should I say. But learn it. Learn the rules. Because you cannot break the rules of football. If you break the rules of football, there's going to be something you will be penalized. The same way if you break the rules of earning Jannah, perhaps you may be penalized. If Allah, through His mercy, forgives you, it's one thing. And this is why we say, never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. In this reality of life, it's never too late. It's only late once you die. Otherwise, it's never too late. You know, shirk is not forgiven by Allah. But if you ask for forgiveness from it and you mend your ways, it's wiped out. It's only not forgiven if you die in that condition. Then it's not forgiven. So this is why we say, make sure, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Make sure you don't die except in the condition of Islam and submission. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us all and may He open our doors. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi bihamdihi subhanaka Allahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka.